would be in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. So if you have your Bible, electronic device, you can go to a Bible app or whatever you want to do and pull up Acts 2, chapter 42 through 47. And the title of my message today is Let's Be Friends. So write that down. I hope you're taking notes today. And before I get started, I wanted to share really quick some context of Acts chapter 2. We're going to pick up um, right after um, Jesus ascends into heaven after the resurrection. He tells about 120 people that were waiting in the upper room, said, just wait here. I'm going to send into heaven. I'm going to send a helper. And we find out that's the Holy Spirit. And so there's all these people waiting and waiting. And, and that's actually um, the first time that we see recorded in the New Testament um, post-resurrection that the church was established. And there's some interesting principles about the local church that we can gain um, from the Bible and that really are applicable to you and I today and how we live our life. And so we're going to pick up um, verses 42 through 47, reads this, says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day, they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added, underline that word added, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Come on, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the local church. It's the hope of the world. Thank you that we can come into a place and, and be encouraged to be lifted up. Lord, we can come into a place and learn the scriptures and dialogue together and spend time together. And Lord, through that, you grow us in amazing ways. And so, Lord, I thank you for every person that came to the 1230 today. That no matter what they're facing, no matter what they're going through, God, that you would just bring a sense of of your peace to their situation. In Jesus' name, we all said amen, amen. Well, um, how many of you, by a show of hands, you are either single um, or maybe in the, the dating season of your life? It's okay, no shame in this. This is good. Okay, great. If you're single, just keep your hands raised high and you want to look around at the other single hands raised um, because this is important, friends. You want to find your future spouse in the local church. Can I get an amen, right? <laughs> Don't go to the club. Don't go to the bar. Go to the church. Way more fun anyways. Uh, but I remember the dating season um, of my marriage, and my husband and I celebrated four years marriage on March 7th, so that's exciting, and um, he's amazing, And but, um, you know, our story is always fun to share, because um, it's a wild one, and when we were in the dating season, it wasn't just, you know, all butterflies and roses, but I actually met my husband when he was 19 years old, um, I had um, moved from Seattle, Washington, to Florida to take a job at Southeastern University, and he was a student, and I was on staff, and I remember meeting, meeting him for the very first time and not knowing that he would be my, my husband in just a few years from that moment, and he had long hair, he was all tatted up, he had a lip ring, and he had like a full beard, and he dressed like he was homeless, <laughs> and... Um, and I remember, you know, he was kind of like interested in me. And I was like, you know, Miss Strong, independent woman, you know, just moved my very first like big career in, you know, in Lakeland, Florida. I was like, I'm dating Jesus and nobody else. Like God has my heart. My date nights consist of worship music and the Bible. You know, I, that was me, you know. So I was like, so he started pursuing me. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm like, you look, yeah, you homeless. Like, you, you got to get your life, you got to get your life right before you can get this, okay? I was like, no, thank you. And so I put up a huge front. You know, I was, I just, I had my guard up. I was like, not about it. I was moving to Florida, all excited about my career. And, um, but I guess the joke was on me because we've been married four years. So that was a huge joke. Um, but, so he, nonetheless, you know, he really was intentional, um, borderline stalker-ish um, when it came to wanting to take me on a date. 
And um, he would tell his friends, and his friends that knew me was like, you know, I really like Holly Jo. She's fine, and I want her to be all mine, you know. And so I finally said, I finally was like, okay, I'll let you take me on a date. But you gotta, you gotta, you gotta do something with this. Like you gotta figure this out. Like you gotta cut the hair. You gotta like take a shower. You gotta like, you gotta go to like Zara or H and M, and you gotta figure it out. Like I don't know. Like you just gotta figure it out. And so um, I remember the very first date we ever went on, July 25th. Um, and he picked me up in the car. And I tell you what, I got in that car, I opened up that door, and this boy had cut his hair. He had taken out his lip ring. He had put the best cologne on. He'd taken a shower. And he wore a suit jacket. I was like, boy, I didn't even know you knew what a suit jacket was, let alone owned a suit jacket. But he was looking very fresh that day. And he impressed me. He was doing really good. Uh, but I don't know about you, I don't love dating. I thought it was really awkward. And I remember we were in the car and you're, you're, you know, you don't really know each other well. So you're trying to have conversation and, and you know, you want to make sure that you look your best, that you act your best and hide all your crazy, right? You're just, you know, the goal is to hide all your crazy all the time. And then when they, you know, you get the ring on the finger, then you can let the crazy out. You know, then you can be like, all right, ha, 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 joke's on you because I'm kind of crazy. Um, so, you know, we didn't show our crazy. We, we kept it together. I had my best outfit on and Joe was looking great. Um, you know, we were, try we were having some conversation. Just super surface level, though, you know, talking about the weather, talked about, you know, nothing from the past or thing like that, just where we want to go in life, but not super deep. Talked about what was happening in the political world. He knew that I was a political science major, so he's asking me all these questions about myself and um, what I thought about this. And I could tell he was trying real hard, right? He takes me to a restaurant called Season 52 in Orlando. And if you've been there before, the unique thing about this restaurant is that they change their menu so many times depending on the season. In addition to that, every meal is under 500 calories. And I was like, okay, this boy don't know me because I can put down a burger and fries. I am like a steak and potatoes girl. Like, make me some steak. He does that now. Like, I come home from church and he'll have like a full steak dinner. I'm like, now you learned after four years. Um, but, you know, we're sitting there across the table, and you can kind of tell, you know, it's like we're kind of performing for each other. You know, don't judge us, because some, some of you that have been on a first date, you know that's kind of what you're doing. You're, you're pretty much going on an audition, right? That's what you're doing on your first date is it's an audition. You want to make sure that you're not showing you're crazy, you have your best outfit on, you look good, you're talking good. You're only sharing what you think that he wants to hear, what she wants to hear, and, and you're, you know, you're talking about things that they're interested in. And really, to be honest, it's just really superficial, right? It's just kind of skimming the top of the relationship. And I was thinking about our relationship with God and God's people, and I had this revelation this week as I was studying that oftentimes in our faith, the way that we act in a dating relationship is often how we act in relationship with the church and God's people. You walk in, you park in the same spot, you put your best outfit on, your new perfume, that new lip liner you got, or guys, some cologne, and you walk in the door and you say hi to the same greeter, you make sure you don't look to the left or the right because that would just throw you off, right? Just throw you off your routine. You walk in, you sit in the very same pew, the same spot. You're probably sitting the same person next to you because they're doing the exact same thing. And, and when you leave church, you get out the same way. You go through these doors. You probably walk around the building. You kind of pass the connections tent really fast because you don't want to get stopped by anybody. Oh, God forbid someone asks you how your day is. You just want to get to the car. You want to get in. And, ooh, and you get in the car and you're like, Yes, I am a Christ follower. I went to church. Check that box. I'm good. And oftentimes, we do that. We live our life. And we miss a lot of opportunities to engage in interpersonal connected relationships. And see, what's beautiful about God is he doesn't just want you to come to church. He wants you to be the church. He wants you to live in such a way that the world sees you interacting with each other. He wants to put people around you and in your corner, they're going to cheer you on in your marriage. They're going to cheer you on in that dating season. They're going to help you parent that rebellion.
rebellious child that's going to help you find that next job. See, God is all about relationship. And how we know this is let's go to the early church. Let's look, because I think it's really important that we look at the first century church to help us and help us give a model of how we are to be today. And there's four things that the early church was founded on. Okay, and these four things were pretty simple. Number one, they continued steadfast in the apostles' teaching. Other words, they came to church and they heard God's word. So congratulations. Number one, you check that off your list. You're here. You're hearing God's word. That's awesome. Number two, it says that they spent time in fellowship. And that's just a churchy word for hanging out together. So outside of gathering together in the temple courts, they made sure that they were living life together, life on life. Number three, breaking of bread. So they had a meal together. Come on, how many of you love food like me? I believe that God dwells at Palace Pizza. So anytime I want to hang out with one of you, I'm like, hey, what are you doing for lunch? Let's go to Palace because God's there. Um, and lastly, the church was founded on this idea of prayer, right? So we spend time praying for the needs of our church. So there's these four main principles that the church was founded on in the first century that you and I are living in that legacy. But here's what has happened. Over the course of the centuries, things have begun to distract us from interpersonal relationship. And I was reading, actually, a, a very interesting report recently. And a report came out, and they've been surveying um, adult Americans for the past two years on how they interact and what they do weekly with their life. And this report came out that the average adult America, American has spends 50 hours a week looking at or engaging with some type of electronic device. And that does include social media platforms within those devices. Okay, that's more than the average work week that you work. That's pretty crazy. And I actually put some statistics together to kind of map this out for you to give you an idea of how disconnected our society can be. If you spend, you spend 40 hours a week, that's the average work week, okay? Let's say you sleep seven hours a night. Okay, that's 49 hours a week that you're sleeping. And then let's add on three hours a day that you are just taking a bath, you're eating food. That's personal care. Then on top of that, add that statistic of 50 hours a week in some type of device, not engaging in relationship. That leaves you with eight hours a week to spend time with your husbands, your wives, your children, and those of value in your life. I don't know about you, but that is a huge red flag. Because what that tells me is that more and more what we're seeing in the community of believers is that instead of coming to church, maybe you're just catching the podcast. Instead of coming to church to engage in the church, maybe you, you're thinking, you know what, I live a good life. I don't need to engage with anybody. I come to church, I do my religious duty, I come and sit in my spot, and then I leave, and I feel really good in my spirit. Well, can I tell you, there's more to life than that? That God wants to do something so profound in your marriage, in your calling, in your relationships, in your life, but guess what? It can't be done in isolation. It must be done when you partner together with the people on your left and right. See, my big point and my only point today, right? This is an Andrew Guard message, okay? My one point, my one point only. Community is God's design for growth. Community is God's design for growth. Why do I know that? Because you and I serve a relational God. And let me tell you, let's back up, let's go to the creation story really quick. Number one, the God that we serve is what we call a triune God. One God, three distinct persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's what we believe here at Grace City Church. Just in that very nature of who God is, that tells you that he's a relational God. So if you and I, we are made in the image of God, then you and I carry that same distinct characteristics deep within our soul. That whether you are an introvert or extrovert, you were called to live in Christian community. That's important for your development as a person. I'm telling you right now. 
You can't bypass go. You can't say, oh, but I'm an introvert and people drive me crazy. You can't do that. God desires for you to be in close interpersonal relationship because there's something powerful that happens when you begin to dialogue about what God's doing in your life, when you begin to partner together. And there's certain things that Christian communities do for you that you can't do on your own. And from the beginning of time, when we read in Genesis, and you see it in the, in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve are spending time together, Bible says that the serpent was the sneakiest, trickiest animal of them all, came in and looked at Eve and said, listen, did God tell you not to eat from the tree of knowledge? And Eve says, well, yeah, that, that's, that's what God told me. And the serpent says, no, I'm going to deceive you. No, I think that God doesn't want you to have his knowledge. So that's why he's not wanting you to eat from that tree. Right in that very moment of scripture, we see the very first moment that the enemy is trying to bring a divide between us and God and us and each other. So from the very first tactic, that was the ultimate goal of the enemy, to bring this division, right? To oppose God's spoken word over your life. Let me tell you, you're going to be faced with situations where you're going to know God's speaking to you and the enemy's going to come and bring doubt into your heart. He's going to come and say, did he really say that? I don't think he really said that. And what you have to do is you have to remind yourself that that is just the enemy trying to bring division to your life where there was meant to be unification. And so in that moment, we know that Eve ate from the tree of knowledge and sin entered the world. But we also know that the story doesn't end there. We as the believers of God, know that our Lord and Savior came as a gift from God. That he looked upon the earth and said, you know what? My people, they can't do this. There's a separation. And there was, if you read throughout the Old Testament, there was a separation between us and God. That people who had a certain religious stature, who were educated, they were able to come into the temple courts and provide sacrifices. And they had several rituals. And that is how they were able to bring atonement for their sin. But people like you and I, there was no relationship. It was religion. So God sent Jesus to the cross, to, to the earth, to fulfill what we could not. And then we know that Jesus fulfilled the ultimate price, paid the price for you and I's sin. And then it says that when Jesus was crucified, three days later he was resurrected, praise God. And in the moment of his resurrection, the Bible says in Matthew 28, that the veil was torn, that there was no more divide anymore. So Jesus brought the unification for us in God. So through faith in Christ, you and I have relationship with God. Isn't that amazing? That's powerful. That's why we're here. But that hasn't stopped the enemy from bringing division to you and I's life. And Andrew preached an amazing message last week talking about the battle has been won, but we are still called to fight. So Jesus, at the cross, the battle is won. There's no more division. But here's how the enemy will work in your life. He wants to bring division between the person on your left and to your right. He wants to bring, a, he wants to pull your guard up. He wants to bring discourse. He wants to bring confusion. He wants to bring offense, unforgiveness. He wants to put gossip in your heart. He wants to do everything to shatter the mission of the gospel. And so what we have to do as believers, as the church of God, we have to come together to fight against it. And here's how we do that. Um, we partner together in relationship. We don't let church become a religious task that makes you feel better. We come into the house of God and we say, you know what? I'm not just going to come and receive and sit in my same pew. I'm going to linger after church. I'm going to meet somebody new today. I'm going to build relationship. I'm going to join team. I'm going to stretch the gifts and talents that God's given me. Further that, I'm going to join a city group that's not on a Sunday. Can you believe what a miracle that would be if each and every one of you took what you're learning on Sunday, spent time together in a city group, dialoguing, growing together. Because the devil is afraid of a unified church. A church that spends time together outside of these four walls. And to be honest with you, I think sometimes we get so caught up 
that this thing called the church is a building and we lose sight that the church is you and I. It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter where you travel. God's presence goes with you to Starbucks. It goes with you to Publix. It goes with you to your home. You can have church meeting in a city group, reading your Bible. And actually every week I'm getting inundated with texts from city group leaders. It's, a, it's amazing. It's one of my favorite highlights of my week. I just got one um, uh, maybe four days ago from Kimber. She's sitting right in the back. She leads an incredible um, young lady city group with our GCYC girls. And she te texted me this week and goes, hey, we were in Starbucks and we were having fun reading our Bibles. And this lady comes up to her like, what are you guys doing? Like, are, are you guys okay? And she and Kimber and the girls like, we're reading our Bibles. We're spending time together in a city group. We go to church. And this lady could not believe that these young people were meeting in a Starbucks reading the Bible. She was astonished at this sight. And she just encouraged them and said how happy she was. But can I tell you that I think that oftentimes we, re we think that people will be opposed to us being the church outside these four walls. That sometimes we're so afraid of what people will think. We're so afraid of what people will say about us. But it has to be done. And here's what Christian community will do for your heart. Number one, there's four, or actually there's three quick little things that I want to say before we wrap up. And this is why Christian community is so important for you. Number one, community provides a sounding board for your life's ups and downs. Have you ever had a bad day? Have you ever been in a very dark season? You know, when I came into the church, you know, like I said earlier, I was not raised in the local church. And so whenever dark seasons came in my family, the coping mechanism was always some type of alcohol abuse, drug abuse, bad relationships. And so when I came into the church, I had to really switch my thinking that when I'm in a dark season, I'm not running to a relationship, I'm not running to a substance, I'm not running to a thing, I'm running to God's people in his house. And when you join in Christian community and you begin to dialogue about your life, when you begin to share the highs and the highs and the lows of lows, you get to realize that there'll be people that you'll meet right in this room that have gone through the very same thing that you've gone through, but you would never know it. See, the person on your left and the right, they might have the solution to your challenge. They might have the answer to the problem that you are facing. But you come in, you, you park in the same spot, sit in the same spot, and you leave right away. And you miss out on the opportunity that God wants to use God's people to bring provision to your life, to bring encouragement and hope to your life. And there's something so beautiful about God's people spending time together, worshiping God together, dialoguing his faith. And then number two, community causes us to take our eyes off ourself and place our interest on others. Something beautiful about serving God's house together. You know, it's so fun. Every Sunday, I am spending time with my best friends serving God's house. There's something so special. And actually, this weekend was just a really special, unique weekend. Um, I have the opportunity to lead our connections team. So that's our team right out here um, that they serve our first-time guests. Awesome. Have some leaders in the room today. Um, and our whole, our whole calling on that team is we want to help people carry out the mission. So the mission of our church is to bring life-transforming relationship to the people of the city. And so what we do is we are a connector of people. We help somebody on their faith journey. So if you're brand new, you've never been in church, or you're newly saved, or maybe you've just been coming to church and you just need to take the next step. Whatever that next step is, that's our role. Our role is to help you. And this weekend on Friday night, there was about 55 of us and we got together and we partied. And, and we, we had so much fun. Uh, we had a church potluck. I, I got up on a chair in front of like 55 of our team leaders. I was like, guys, I haven't been to a church potluck since I was 12 when I went to a state park for a family reunion. This, like we're having church today. But it was so beautiful. It was, we had literally people brought food. Um, every, we had a whole table. I had pictures. We have uh, baked beans, hot dogs, hamburgers, jello salad. I mean, come on, that's real Polk County, jello salad. <laughs> and, and it was beautiful. 
And we played games, we hung out, we talked, we bonfire, we roasted marshmallows. And there came a point where I sat on a chair and I gathered them together and I said, guys, I want to hear some testimonies. I want to hear about what God is doing on our team. And one by one, they began to share what God was doing. And in that moment, faith began to stir. And there were so many testimonies of what God was doing in your, this is your church. People are getting saved. They're attending growth track. They're not just going to growth track. They're getting on team. And then they're joining team. And all of a sudden, they're being stretched and challenged in their leadership. And their, their relationship with God is going deep, not just wide. And that's what's happening. And that track, that journey can be your journey. You can step into a new faith this season and walk closer together with the people surrounding you. And you'll see what God's going to do. And then last, lastly, community reveals your gifts and your talents. Community reveals your gifts and talents. You know, any time that we gather together, I always love doing what's called the honor circle. And the honor circle is... Um, Previous places I've been, done this, and they taught me. And you get around a circle and say, hey, I want you to call up the gifts and the people around you. Just pick somebody and just begin to call up the gifts. You may not know them very well, but you might like their smile. You might like their presence. I want you to honor. Now, how crazy is that? We don't live in a society that honors people. So as a church, we need to be the first people to honor the gifts within us, right? That's the example to the world. And so we, we sat in a circle, we honoring. And can I tell you, that's what happens when you partner with the people of God in his house, is all of a sudden you begin to meet people with the same vision, same mind, and you might be feeling insecure about the gifts that God's given you. You might be feeling a little down and out because of the season you're in. But all of a sudden you partner together and you realize and you get with someone and they say, hey, listen, I know that you're going through that. I know that you stepped out in faith to start that business. And maybe, just maybe, you're feeling like the resources aren't coming, but I know somebody, and I want to encourage you that the best days are ahead. That business will thrive. Hey, I know what you're going through in your marriage. I've been there, but let me tell you, you're an amazing wife. You're an amazing husband. Hey, you're an amazing school teacher. Don't give up on teaching those fifth graders. You got this. See what happens? You begin, your faith begins to expand, and all of a sudden the gifts start being pulled out of you, and you're like, wow. I am pretty awesome. I am, I am pretty something, right? I have something to contribute. And um, when I married my husband, he's a sports fanatic. Loves every sport. Literally, you could sit down with him and talk with him for hours. And he is incredible. Knows everything about every team and every arena. And when I married him, I started to learn a little something about sports. And in football season, he actually puts all his favorite games on my calendar. Because he wants to make sure I don't plan a date day. He's like, honey, don't ask me to mow the lawn. Don't ask me to cook. Don't ask me to take in a date. It's University of Miami football. Like, this is it, okay? Got some UM fans in the house. Thank you. And so, but I learned a lot about sports. And recently we were dialoguing about this thing called the home field advantage. And when a team obviously is playing, there's a home team and an away team, Right? And this advantage that home teams have, um, really it's an advantage, meaning that if you are a team and you're playing on your home field, in your home city, that the success rate and the chances of you winning are higher than if you're the away team. Now, if you're a sports person, don't deba debate me later, we'll talk, but I know there's lots of logistics about that, but the number one thing on why that is, is because when the players come onto the court or the field, all of a sudden, where they might have been feeling some fear or intimidation about their gifts and their talents, they step into the arena and they begin to hear the roar of the cheer. They begin to hear their names being chanted. They begin to know that people are for them and not against them. And can I tell you that that is Grace City Church? That is the church that when you walk in, you're not secluded. You're surrounded. You're surrounded by people that are going to cheer you on. They're going to tell you that, hey, this is your home team. And baby, you're home. And you're going to win the battle. You're going to win the fight. So we don't need critics in the church. We need more cheerleaders in the church. So when you partner together in this thing called a church, the gifts and the talents begin to get pulled out of you in a very unique way. 
and you begin to live the God-given purpose and calling in your life. And I want to have the band come up. I'm going to end with a story. Um, I really believe that nothing has transformed my life more than being a part of God's house. When I was 16 and got saved, I became a youth leader. And then later in my 19, 20, 21 years old, um, I came part of a church that did an internship program. And before I did that, you know, I was coming to church, right? I would sit down and listen to the message. But it wasn't fully impacting my Monday through Saturday. I was hearing it on Sundays. I was raising my hands in worship. But it was not translating to the rest of my life. And I knew that there was something more. And so when I did this internship program, it broke me down in so many ways. And I met most of my very best friends in all the world and spent a lot of time with people day in, day in, day and I, sleeping at the church at some points, cleaning the church, um, engaging a relationship with people of God's house and serving God's house. And during that whole season, my family thought I had gone crazy. And I remember getting phone calls and texts why are, you at, why are you not at this birthday party? Why is it Sunday and you've been at church for three services? Come home. What are you doing? What do you see in this? this, this you, you need to go get your four-year four degree, make six figures, achieve that dream that you have in your heart, do something that actually means something. And so anytime something tragic happened in our family, I would always get a phone call because I was the church girl in my family. I was the one reading my Bible, praying and worshiping. And so anytime something heavy came into the family, I was always the one to carry that burden. And to be honest, in many ways, it's actually shaped who I am today because I have a stronger foundation in Jesus because of those moments of my life. And so don't be despised if you're in this room and you didn't come from a church background. That wasn't the language of your home. Can I tell you, you're, gonna be, you're still gonna be an amazing man and woman of God that you still will raise a family who knows Jesus, that you can become a first century Christian in your family, that you actually have the opportunity to change history forever. It's my honor and my privilege that I will be a first generation pastor in my family. It's an honor and a privilege that I get to change history in the Hepler home. But I remember getting a phone call one day and it was my brother and he was in tears and he didn't know God living a crazy life on drugs, drinking, partying all the time. He said, hey, our family friend Sabina was in a horrible car accident and she's in ICU on life support. The doctor said that she might have days to live. The swelling in her brain was causing so much pressure that all of her organs were shutting down. I got off the phone and my hands were literally shaking. And I had this thought, God, I can't handle this that this burden is too much for my individual soul. I know I've been coming to church, I've been serving, but God, I'm carrying all these burdens for my family. This is really hard for me. So I thought, you know what? Okay, I'm gonna call a girlfriend from the church. So I called my friend, I said, hey, Natalie. I said, I know you don't know this family friend, but I have a friend who's in the hospital right now who's on life support. And to be honest, my family wants me to come and I don't know what I'm gonna say, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Her family's there, this is a dire situation. What do I do? She goes, oh, the answer's simple. Let me gather some of our friends from the church together and we'll meet you at the church. I'll be there in one hour. So I go to the church, not knowing her and maybe a girlfriend would show up. An hour later, I'm at the church and I see walking through the doors over 50 people from the church coming with guitars, with Bibles, walking in with smiles on their face. They said, come on, let's go to the chapel. So in every hospital, there's a chapel. We went to the chapel, this little tiny little space with this old rugged cross, with these crazy stained glass windows. We walk in and somebody goes to the piano. Somebody starts playing on their guitar. People start walking around the room, worshiping, praying, praying out loud. I begin to text my family, say, hey, listen, we're here at the church. I have some friends from the church coming and I want you to come down. I want you to pray with us. So here comes my family, my brother and his friends. And they come and they're watching this happen. 
And for four to five hours, we begin to pray. And we begin to ask God for miracles. And my faith, which was so weak at the beginning, by the end of that, I was stirred. I was walking around shouting. I was crying. I was kneeling at the cross saying, God, you have to save this woman who doesn't know you. We kept getting reports from the doctors that every hour the brain swelling began to decrease. And the doctor looked at the family and said, I don't know what's going on, that what you're doing in the chapel right now. I know that I heard that there's friends down there praying, but there's no medical explanation on why the brain is decreasing in size right now. And her organs are beginning to reinitiate. They're beginning to work again. She is going to make it. And can I tell you, she walked out of that ICU weeks later. She was healed by the power of prayer. That's the church. When I couldn't live life alone, when I was isolated, when I was full of discouragement and fear, I called the church. Friends, maybe you're not in a situation like that tonight. Maybe you are doing okay. But can I tell you, there will be a moment that you're gonna need to make that phone call. You're going to need to call that girlfriend, that guy friend. You're going to say, listen, I don't know what to do in this moment. Can you help me? But if the enemy can isolate you, he wins. But we won't let that happen here at Grace City. We want to make sure that you're connected, that you're surrounded by men and women that will be there for you, that will encourage you in every season. And here's the beautiful part about the story. After we were worshiping, my brother and his friends were so moved by what God did. They got on their knees in that chapel. And for the very first time, they gave their heart to Jesus. See what happens when you step out of faith, outside of these walls, call on each other, spend time together. And what's interesting, if you notice in Acts chapter 2, the very last sentence says this. It says, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The Lord added to those that were being saved. Salvation is a byproduct of our Christian community. Salvation happens when all of a sudden the world around us begins to see the people of God linked arms together, not fighting against each other, but fighting for each other. When the world sees that happen, I am telling you, people that don't know God begin to flock through these doors. They begin to say, what's on you? I want that on me. I want that love. I want that kindness. I want that, I want that spirit of faith. Friends, the world is watching the church right now. And we need to be careful. We have an opportunity to live out our Christian life outside the four walls of these church because the world is watching. And the world needs your faith. The world needs your joy. The world needs your love. And I believe God's going to do it in your heart today.